and welcome to the Aerospace Village panel discussion on building communications across the aviation ecosystem. Hi, let me introduce myself. My name is Katie Trimble Noble, and I'm the Director of Product Security Incident Response and Bug Bounty at Intel. So I run the Bug Bounty program as well as uh, researcher outreach and engagement. Um, and I've been with really in the ecosystem for many, many years. Uh, prior to coming over to Intel, I worked for the Department of Homeland Security where I was the section chief for vulnerability management and coordination. So I've been doing this for several years. Uh, throughout my career, I've coordinated and disclosed over 20,000 cybersecurity vulnerabilities. So I really wanna jump in right now. We don't have a lot of time today and I want to go ahead and introduce our panel. Um, so we're gonna ask everybody to go through and introduce themselves. So Randy, can we start with you? Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Randy Talley. I'm a uh, senior advisor with uh, DHS's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Been working in aviation uh, for quite a while uh, as, a, as a pilot uh, doing aviation security for DHS and uh, have been uh, on the, excuse me, the tri-chair, the DHS tri-chair for the, aviation, or for the uh, aviation cyber initiative for the last two and a half years. Awesome, Sid? Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sid Geji. I'm uh, I work uh, at FAA. I, I'm a manager within the uh, Office of Information Security and Privacy. Uh, I've been with the agency about 14 years and uh, in a, in a variety of different roles. And I serve as the tri chair for the FAA on the Aviation Cyber Initiative for the past two and a half years as well. I am uh, glad to be here. It's my first year at DEFCON. A lot of smart people uh, in the room, uh, you know, virtually, and uh, I look forward to learning from you all. So uh, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks. Welcome, Sid. Welcome to DEF CON. I hope this experience is awesome for you. You get a little bit of a different flavor this year. So, John? Hi, my name is John Craig. I'm the Chief Engineer of Cabin Network and Security Systems at the Boeing Company. I've been there for around 34 years. I've worked in all sorts of systems groups on commercial airplanes, and my current role has me working uh, all the cabin systems, the networks on the airplane. Um, I work the development of the connectivity links, and I'm responsible for product security for commercial airplanes. I'm also the chairman of the Aviation ISAC, and um, I'm really like to encourage people to look up that organization. It provides a great sharing um, opportunity in aviation. Thanks. Yeah, welcome. Jen? Hi, I'm Jen Ellis. I'm the VP of Community and Public Affairs at Rapid7. Um, and I am probably the least of the aviation uh, experts on this panel. When I say probably, I mean definitely. Um, but I, I represent the voice of, I think, the um, security research community. And my, my job is to think about how do you leverage uh, security research and insight and expertise to create social change that uh, makes a more secure, safer world. Awesome, awesome. Jeff? Hi, I'm Jeff Troy. I'm the president of the Aviation ISAC. I've been in that role for about three and a half years. I also work for uh, General Electric. I'm on the staff of the CISO at General Electric Aviation. And uh, I'm on the board of directors of the National Defense ISAC, so uh, very engaged in the uh, information sharing world. Uh, prior to that, I was with the FBI for 25 years and uh, uh, left there um, in the cyber division, you know, working the cyber criminal and national security cases. Glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah, happy to have you. Alan? Hi, I'm Al Burke, and I'm an Associate Deputy Director in the Air Force's Cyberspace Operations and Warfighter Communications, and I'm also the uh, Department of Defense Chair for the Aviation Cyber Initiative. You know, I come out of the airspace and missile defense operations community, and my primary focus in the ACI is on improving cybersecurity uh, um, uh, initiatives and resilience of derivative aviation capabilities where the uh, DOD, interagency, and industry objectives intersect. Awesome, awesome. I'm excited to hear more about that later. So now that we've all kind of introduced ourselves and we have a good idea who we are and where we come from, you can see we have a just 
jam-packed panel full of awesome aviation cyber and researcher uh, professionals here. So I'm really excited about it. Let's, let's really just jump right in here. So today in this panel, we're gonna talk a little bit about some current activities between government industry, security, the security community, the responsible disclosure community, some information sharing, uh, and some improved collaboration and coordination across the aviation sector. So really jam-packed. Um, I want to step back just a little bit and explain and go through just a little bit of the groundwork on uh, what the Aviation Cyber Initiative is. And so, Randy, can you talk really briefly about what the Aviation Cyber Initiative is in the Tri-Chair? Sure, Katie, you'd love to. Uh, Aviation Cyber Initiative actually started probably around the five years ago, the 2016 timeframe. Uh, it was it was originally focused on on aircraft only. There was some testing that our DHS S and T uh, folks were doing, uh, and and was was of interest to everyone. And uh, we've we've taken that, and a lot of things has happened since that initial surge or testing, if you will. Uh, the National Strategy for uh, Aviation Security was published by the White House uh, about a year and a half ago. We're getting close to two years ago. And uh, it specifically was, a, was an update. Uh, the NSAS needed to be updated. It was dated back in 2016. It was old, and it didn't include anything about cybersecurity, nor did it include anything about UAS. So that was a big upgrade, if you will, for, uh, for the NSAS. It also defined the aviation ecosystem, which, uh, which really helped us out. It kind of defines the swim lanes, if you will, for for uh, aviation security. So, so those, those six swim lanes as defined include the aircraft obviously, but it also talks about airports, talks about airlines, airlift, airlift being the, the cargo deriv derivative or equivalent of the airlines. Uh, talks about actors, uh, which can mean anything from training to to third party vendors on an airport. It could it could be anything that has to do with people, and it goes into aviation management, which is all the infrastructure necessary to run the aviation environment. So so all of those things are our swim lanes. It, it's a little easier for us, the Aviation Cyber Initiative, to uh, to to talk about this when you're talking about the the various swim lanes as as opposed to a big amorphous blob. So. What is the ACI? Well, I, I talked a little bit about it initially. A year ago, we were chartered by the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Secretary of Defense, and the Secretary of Transportation uh, to, to be a tri-chaired organization. So I have my DOD colleague, uh, Al, and Sid, my FAA colleague, and we lead this effort uh, across the whole of government uh, to include industry and to include uh, anybody that's really looking at aviation cybersecurity uh, to pull them in and try to reduce air risks and increase air resiliency across, across aviation. So I'm, I'm very proud to participate in that. That gives you a little background. I don't want to get too much in, in depth in it, but I think that uh, that should answer your question. Yeah, really good. Thank you. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about uh, some re a recent situation that I kind of really feel was a really good example of a watershed moment within the researcher aviation and public sector communities. Um, so this happened about a year ago, um, and Jen Rapid Seven made a, a pretty it's a pretty interesting disclosure on civil aviation uh, last year. Can you walk us through that and kind of give us your perspective on the process? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so. We have a, a researcher, Patrick Kiley, who has done a background in transportation in the past. He um, has done a lot specifically with um, automotive. He's also a pilot and he's uh, building his plane as, as one does, apparently. Um, and so uh, as part of his sort of, you know, passion and enthusiasm in this area, he was investigating various things. And he heard about a technology being used in um, small aircraft uh, that is... Um, well known in the security community as being uh, sort of quite trivial to to exploit. So uh, the, the technology is CAN bus, and he heard that it was being used um, as a way of sort of connecting avionics. 
And the avionics, you know, being, being the parts that control the plane, he was like, oh, that sounds quite dangerous. And he was well aware that a few years back, there had been a lot of noise made around about CAN bus in automotive. And there'd been very widespread discussion in the automotive industry. And as a result, many automotive um, organizations either moved away from using CAN bus or, or introduced additional mitigations and protections. He had not heard of such a discussion in uh, the aviation space and actually on talking to more people who work in aviation, he found that, you know, generally security people seemed to believe it was an issue, but said that they were having trouble in having this be talked about at the right levels and get enough attention to really make a change. So, um, so he did some research on that. And our goal with the research from the beginning was never to to sort of shame a particular vendor or embarrass a, a vendor. This wasn't a, um, we're gonna take a specific vendor system and uncover new vulnerabilities. It's much more of an architectural issue and, and a known issue. So the goal was to look at a few different systems, verify that Canvas was in fact being used and then talk about why that's an issue on a sort of strategic level and try and stimulate some discussion in the aviation community around it. Um, as a result, and also because we were dealing with aviation and, you know, we recognize that aviation is a different space. It, you know, there is a sort of life and death element when you're talking about things to do with aviation. Um, we were very cautious with how we approached it. Our typical disclosure process, which is documented and on the internet, is normally a sort of 60 day process, sometimes a bit longer. This process took a year and a half. And the reason was uh, two things. One, we very much did not want to cause hysteria. You know, as, as somebody who flies a lot, um, I, I know how, it, how easy it is to get spooked on this stuff and, I, um, and the rest of the team were very keen not to have that be the case. Um, so we wanted to be very thoughtful with the approach that we took and, and we wanted to be very balanced and as neutral as possible. And the second thing is that we really did want to try and stimulate this discussion, that was our goal. So we wanted to try and involve as many people to participate in that process as possible and really sort of like immerse the community as much as, as we could. Um, it was a somewhat mixed process. Uh, you know, there's not, there's not a lot of um, uh, tried and true ways of doing this in aviation, even for an organization like Rapid7 who've done a lot of vulnerability disclosure, uh, a lot of vulnerability research over the years. Like aviation, you know, is, every sector is a little different and aviation is certainly uh, also a little different. Um, and what we found was that generally, uh, people, including many of the people on this call, were very, very uh, generous with their time and their insight, their expertise. So we had a lot of people who were willing to talk to us, which was great because we were worried at the beginning that that wouldn't be the case. Um, but we also found that there was a, a bit of a flavor in, uh, in the discussion that came across of, you know, people sort of pointing out that, that we weren't aviation experts and that physical security would take care of this and that you know we weren't understanding how pilots work now here's the thing is um certainly i'm not an aviation expert and i and i was very glad to have input and have expertise from people who really are immersed in this space it was a great learning for me um but in general i think anybody who works in cybersecurity is always going to be a little leery of any sector that really leans hard on physical security as a response to cybersecurity challenges and while we were very aware always very aware and acknowledged in the report that physical access was required to exploit this system we're also very aware that these systems stay in place for a very long time and that motivated attackers will find ways, particularly when you're talking about smaller aircraft, which might not have quite the same degree of um, physical protection that, you know, sort of larger commercial aircraft might. Um, so that, there was a little bit of that. And then I think, I think Patrick probably felt a little bit affronted every time he got told that he didn't know how pilots worked since he may not be a, a commercial pilot, but you know, he, he has flown planes. So um, it was good to get the feedback. We were super grateful to have, uh, to have the ears and to have the feedback. And, and we certainly wanted to challenge our own assumptions. Um, but what we did learn through the way is that, yes, it's always, I think with any, um, coordinated vulnerability disclosure, and we are big advocates for coordinated vulnerability disclosure. It is 
critical and key to build empathy, empathy, to listen actively, to take on board feedback and to challenge your own assumptions um, and to try and build trust. Like I think above all, trust is, is where you want to get to. Um, but you also have to know when to hold the line on your, like, yes, challenge your own assumptions, but hold your line once you've done that and you've verified that your findings are, are as you think they are. Um, so it was a good learning process for us. And I think in the end, um, the disclosure went well. One thing just before I wrap that I'll say is, I think part of the reason the disclosure went so well was because of the role that DHS has uh, played. Um, I think that having um, the Vulnerability uh, Management Center part of CISA, which <clears throat> Katie was kind of running at the time, um, having you guys independently verify the research findings and then decide that it was a significant enough issue to put out your own alert to coincide with our report, that to me was a pretty big deal. It was actually kind of a game changer, I think. Um, I, I can't say whether we would have bowed to pressure if that had not been the case, but I'm certainly very grateful that we didn't have to make that choice. So thank you. And thank you to everyone else on the call who helped educate us along the way and, and gave us their time and their feedback. Yeah, it's definitely a complicated situation. I think a lot of times it's difficult when you think about every sector is different and you know your ICS systems, your embedded systems, your safety systems, they're very complex. And doing that coordination up and down the hardware stack is a little different than you would necessarily see in say a digital services sort of platform or in a general typical traditional software platform. So it's definitely learning, I think for everyone. And there, there are some ups and downs in that. Um, and I think that when you look at it, you have to take it for, uh, we're, we're gonna look at climate versus weather. You know, if we look at one each individual disclosure, it's pretty tough, but in the end, we learned a lot. So uh, Randy, can you talk a little bit about the DHS got involved in this disclosure? Can you talk a little bit about how DHS got involved in the disclosure and um, what role DHS took? Sure, you know, we have the, uh, the vulnerability disclosure program that DHS runs. Great group of folks. As a matter of fact, I think Jay Angus is going to have a panel at the Aerospace Village on vulnerability disclosure. So I invite you to go and, and listen to that. Great, That's great right. folks. Uh, they approached me, great folks, including you, Katie, approached me and said, uh, hey, I've got an aviation thing. I need to, I need to get it to you. I need, to, need you to understand and we need to know kind of where we go from here. Uh, so I was able to get the briefing from, from Rapid7. Uh, actually got to re read their final draft report, if you will. Uh, and you have to realize in aviation, aviation is a big thing. So I, I've got a, a big background in aviation, but uh, the CAN bus, where it's installed, you know, different aircraft vendors, it's a, it's, it's a, a huge try, thing to try to go, oh yeah, I got this. So, mm -hmm. so how important is it? Well. It w did require physical access, so I could stand down a little bit from that. I think everybody understood that. But, you know, what, how does it affect commercial aviation? How does it sm affect small, small aircraft or the, the general aviation uh, folks? So, so I said, look, we need to get it to two places. We need to get to the FAA. They're the regulator. They should be aware of this because they need to make a risk assessment if it's a, if it's a big thing. We also need to get it to the Aviation ISAC. Aviation ISAC uh, has their members, they can quickly get it out to aircraft manufacturers and, and actually the folks who are building systems and determine, hey, what can I do with this? Or what should I be doing with this in the future? Uh, I think uh, this was the first time since the uh, ACI has been stood up that we've had a vulnerability disclosure uh, come to me. Uh, it's not the last time, but it was the first time. Uh, it was handled very well, I think, by Rapid7. I think uh, I think they understood going in. Uh, you know, the the physical access aspect was a was, was a big deal. The acknowledgement of that. It wasn't the skies falling. It was, hey, this is an issue, and we need to address it. And and I love that part of it. Uh, I know our VDP folks, the vulnerability disclosure folks, were very uh, interested in, hey, look, we need to send out an advisory. It's going to mirror what we did on the cars years ago, uh, and it's also going to say, hey, it does require fiscal access. So then, once again, not, a, not, not the sky is falling, we found a vulnerability, but a, 
this is something you should be aware of when you're when you're architecting a, a system. So so it was very it was very good for me. I enjoyed uh, getting involved in, in it to this level. And then you know the focus for that vulnerability disclosure is is can we get uh, you know how do we approach a mitigation? If we found a vulnerability, how do we approach a mitigation? How do we close that down? and make the the system more safe and secure and i think we achieved that in this particular case great um yeah it's we go back to that physical security and i think overwhelmingly one of the big things that was very different from say this disclosure to a, a disclosure that we might see somewhere else is that this is more of an architecture it affects a lot of different things versus say one particular product and one particular version and so just the impact was very um awe-inspiring. Like we didn't know where things were, so we really had to rely on the subject matter experts, and we really had to bring in a lot of different people to ask and find out. And so, Sid, can you really quickly tell us about uh, your work and how you were brought in and talked to uh, some of your colleagues at the FAA and the safety that went involved was involved in that? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, uh, Randy kind of brought this up last year, and uh, I, th I think I agree with you, Katie. I think it was a watershed moment. It's a good way to describe it. We had a researcher that came forward with a vulnerability. Uh, Rapid7 came, came to us and uh, they said, hey, look, this is important. You know, this is an issue. And so uh, it really helped kind of spur a set of conversations within the FAA, uh, both from our AVS, which is this aviation safety organization within the agency, the CISO was on the call, and it helped us, I think, uh, you know, really connect different offices. And so, granted, it's a physical security issue, and I believe another, the other thing that happened also was TSA was notified. Um, that's the agency that's responsible for all of aviation security in the, in the U.S. So it really helped us connect with different stakeholders and, um, and really lay the groundwork for a process. Um, there's going to be a lot of back and forth in such situations between the safety engineers, the regulators, the, uh, the researchers, and, and that's really, in my mind, very, very good, and it's healthy. We want to spur those types of conversations. Everybody's not going to agree on what, what exactly, how big the risk is, um, and so it can get a little difficult to come to get to the same page, but I think having those conversations is really important and I think this event helped us do that. So thanks to Rapid7, thanks to DHS and the ISAC for, uh, for taking the lead on this. Yeah, yeah. So that actually leads us right into, Jeff, can you talk about the ISAC and, and the ISAC is information sharing. And so if you really want to affect change, you need to get the information out there. You need to make sure that people understand. So can you talk to us about your, your involvement in this? Thanks, Katie. Yeah, so first off, we were just really highly appreciative of Rapid7's approach to this and uh, allowing us to be invited in. Uh, similarly to Randy and the rest of the folks at the uh, Aviation Cyber Initiative for uh, being so inclusive, letting us, uh, you know, kind of get this information and, and be able to pass it out to the members. So like uh, has been mentioned uh, earlier, you know, the aviation ISAC's role in these security disclosures is really uh, a connector. And, you know, Jen highlighted how important it is for communication to be happening during these events. And typically when they start, it's really hard for a researcher to find the right person in the industry. Um, we also mentioned here, though, that this was a little different. This is a technology that's broadly used across the industry, and it's actually something a lot of other folks plug into. Um, many times when a researcher has a particular uh, disclosure they want to make, it's, it's about one type of product. There's one vulnerability uh, in some design of a, a specific component. Uh, when researchers want to get a hold of that company, frequently they're calling us because if, if you want to get a hold of somebody in the industry, it's a lot harder nowadays actually to find the right person and we just happen to have them all connected in our community. Um, but this one, this one was different and it was a great learning experience for us all uh, because there was a, a little bit of a shorter window on the industrial side, but uh, as we look back at the event, it really made a lot of sense because there wasn't somebody that was one particular 
company to take a look at this. This was more of everybody saying, hey, wait a minute, we're all plugging into this. We really need to take a look at this as a, a larger issue and as a, a systems issue. Uh, in the end, um, we did, and it, it's been mentioned as well, right, there was a, a physical security component. That is one component. Uh, but in the whole concept of layered security, you know, physical security is just one layer. And when you find that there is an issue inside of any layer, um, the objective in a really good layered concept is to harden that layer. And this was uh, a really good example of that. It's like, it doesn't matter if, if it's embedded in a lower layer, let's get every layer as hard as it can possibly be and make it difficult for anyone to make that, that complete penetration. So uh, I, I would agree with everyone. I think this was a, a really good example of how to do it right. Uh, and I think what was really impressive for us too, um, as the trust gets built across the engagement between the researchers and the industry, uh, was really good to see you know, um, what Jen talked about was the perspective from, right from the start, hey, we don't wanna get people um, overly excited or hysterical about something. We really need to understand in the whole equation of risk, you know, how big of a risk is this and you know, how does that risk get managed? And uh, their approach that they took, that cautious approach of really trying to get that understanding and validation uh, was really critical to the successful outcome. Awesome. So I think this is a great opportunity and a, it was a great example of pieces that didn't ever, you know, typically work together and who were new to each other and maybe didn't even know that the other existed and were able to really pull together. And there were some ups and downs. And in the end, uh, Rapid7 put out their vulnerability information, DHS put out a complimentary uh, security advisory and I think it, it sort of laid the groundwork. So now that we kind of talked about that, I really want to pivot to the current. Um, so there are some really awesome progress being made in the aviation and researcher communities. And it, it's it's hard to even pull a couple of topics when I when I sat down to kind of go through and say, what can we talk about here? Uh, it was there were just so many topics out there. The the community is is moving so rapidly. And I think even the aviation village itself is something that 10 years ago we wouldn't have even thought of we could pull together and do that. And so there's so many wonderful things. Uh, John, Boeing is getting involved in some really awesome community outreach and community engagement. Can you talk a little bit about the Tech Council? Yeah, <clears throat> so I'll start off with, you know, aviation is a unique space and we have a very strong safety culture. We have a unique development process. And, you know, to some extent, I think we view ourselves as being special. And, um, you know, Jen kind of mentioned earlier that when people come from outside that community, the natural antibodies kick in and we find reasons to kind of discount the feedback. Um, I've been working in this space for 10 to 15 years and, you know, reality kind of kicked in on me when the uh, Stuxnet virus was, was uh, disclosed and it broke all my, you know, stereotypes of aviation and how we're unique. Um, you know, and, and oftentimes I feel like an evangelist out trying to spread the good word. Well, last year was a significant milestone and I'd say turning point for Boeing. Um, a researcher um, got a hold of some of our executable code, reverse engineered it, and um, disclosed things that were actually quite surprising. I, I think we were surprised with the tools um, that allowed them to actually go in and, you know, kind of view the code in, uh, you know, in a space where we didn't think was really possible. We actually spent a lot of time, um, several months, analyzing the code. We were in our lab. We have very extensive labs that replicate the airplane um, quite accurately. Um, at the end of it, we actually went out onto an airplane. We brought all the systems engineers out to uh, view it. We uh, went through a bunch of scenarios. Um, some of the claims, we actually went well beyond the claims. Um, we did a pretty thorough test on a 787. And at the end of that, um, our response, you know, not knowing, you know, it wasn't the real intent, but I think it was viewed as hostile. And, and I got that feedback from several folks, um, you know, in the uh, aerospace village. And so after our analysis disclosure, we held a meeting with a lot of key stakeholders. A lot of the airlines had a lot of questions for us. You know, what do you think of this? Is it real? You know, we gave our um, synopsis. A lot of the government folks, and Katie, you were in one of the meetings with us. We had a spirited discussion with lots of different government people, as you remember. And in that meeting, um, 
Katie kind of said, you know, John, you really need to reach out to these folks and I can help you if you'd like. So we took that, we went internal to Boeing and we had some spirited discussions because this is really uncomfortable. You know, changing how we've operated for a long time is uh, not the easiest thing. Um, but at the end of the day, we said, you know what, we, we need to do this because um, these people are out looking at our designs. They're not, you know, I don't think there's any um, ill will, but we need to embrace them and we need to learn from them. And so we set up this tech council and um, we had several meetings trying to level set a little bit. It's, it's a little hard via the phone. Um, and so after the RSA conference in San Francisco in February, we invited them all back to Boeing. And at Boeing, we, we uh, kind of went over um, some of our design methodologies and you know met face to face and that's a real um that's real powerful to get to know people at a much more personal level we uh took them into our labs showed them what we're capable of um we even arranged time on a 787 simulator in fact one of the gentlemen was a military pilot and we uh, set up kind of a difficult landing for him high winds and you know low light conditions etc he, he made it down good which was positive but I think it went a long way to mending the uh, adversarial relationship. So as part of that, we have uh, part of this team. Um, they have a, uh, um, some folks have a claim they'd like to investigate with us. And we're in the, we were in the process of bringing them into Boeing into our lab to kind of evaluate that when, you know, the COVID hit and that kind of has slowed us down a little bit. But, you know, I, I really want to embrace this and I want to expand it and, you know, at DEF CON, we actually plan on bringing, you know, real hardware, um, setting up some kind of capture the flag event to kind of embrace this community much more. Another aspect of this, um, we actually matured our vulnerability dis disclosure process. It is now um, very easy to find on the Boeing website, at least I hope it is for folks I was able to find it. Um, and you can send your vulnerabilities encrypted. We uh, provide that means. Um, and we're starting to receive a lot of stuff in. And a lot of things that come in um, are shared between all the stakeholders. And as the product guy for the airplane, we see all of it and we actually evaluate. It's surprising vulnerabilities that are in the IT space. A lot of these systems are used um, in some form in aerospace. And so we have to evaluate all those and see if we have the same issue that maybe the um, original claim came in with. So I'll just close, you know, saying we're still crawling here. Um, I'm really hoping to get more engaged. Um, you know, it, I think it's critical that we interject this into our designs. It's a different view and, you know, it's always powerful to get diverse opinions and diverse perspectives. And those outside of aviation probably are more powerful at looking at our designs than um, we may be, so thanks. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I know I remember sitting in some of those meetings and I, I remember thinking to myself, what, why don't we all just talk, you know, why can't we just, why don't we all just talk? And I, I can imagine that there were some people in that room who thought that I was just that crazy lady from Homeland Security with these, these wild dreams of, of uh, working together, but I, I'm hopeful that we're going to see more of that and that that has actually worked out really well. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're still in, in, in steps here and, and I would like to, you know, commend Boeing because Boeing did all the hard work on that. You know, the hard, the hardest part is getting going and, and taking all of the, all of the steps that needed to happen in order to bring people in and really get down into the labs and get into the weeds. And that, that's, that takes a lot, a lot of effort. And so, you know, I commend Boeing for that. Thanks. So Sid, can you talk a little bit about the FAA structure and the work with the tri-chair and some of the, the things that you've been working with? Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Katie. I, um, I agree with everything that has been said on this great panel. I think, let me, let me make a few points. Um, you know, we kind of oversee and regulate civil aviation. So we have a unique role. We are the premier aviation agency in the U.S. We have authority over all the aircraft that fly in the U.S. and uh, all the airmen, all the pilots. Uh, we certify them. We certify all the aircraft. Um, and we also conduct air traffic control. All the airplanes that take off and land are, are controlled by the FAA. So, um, it's a pretty big role. It's a pretty big responsibility. Responsibility. I think safety is our focus, and uh, we are a safety agency. And so, um, 
I, the way I see it, it is that cybersecurity is part of our safety responsibility. Um, and I, I run into that all the time. Um, as a tri chair for the ACI, you know, it's, it's really a the big task is culture change. We are trying to bring that uh, culture of security and looking at um, how to improve the security of the whole e ecosystem into an agency that's focused primarily on safety. Um, so in terms of vulnerability disclosure, we don't have like a formal program. We don't have like a way that uh, you all, the researchers can come forward and, and directly to us. Um, we rely on DHS, which is our partner through the ACI. But that does not mean that we are not open uh, to all of your ideas. Um, I think the fact that uh, uh, I'm here on a panel, uh, you know, I'd love to hear from you all. Um, and, and, and we love to have that, that dialogue about what, what the risk is and what some of the vulnerabilities are. So I wanna echo what has been said earlier. I think trust building is incredibly important. Uh, we all should come together and like Katie said, we need to be talking all the time <laughs> and uh, exchanging notes and uh, exchanging ideas. Uh, let me share a quick story. About two years ago, I was at the Pentagon and uh, DOD has this team called Gen5. That's basically a, you know, a bunch of uh, very smart people just like you all that were looking at some of the vulnerabilities uh, within ADSP, which is our system for uh, surveillance-based uh, air traffic control. It's satellite-based, I'm sorry, uh, air traffic control. We are moving away from radar into satellite-based uh, GPS, uh, you know, radar contr control. And so they had worked on this project um, for about a year to look at some of the vulnerabilities within ADSP, which is a huge investment for the FAA and for the American public. And I was uh, with the CISO at the time and some other executives from FAA and, and we just thought it was fantastic. I mean, to invite these researchers into the Pentagon and have them test uh, an, an aviation system uh, and hear some of their ideas. They actually came out with a report uh, which was super insightful. And uh, we took it all the way to the National Security Council. Um, and that has formed the basis for a lot of the follow-on work that's going on within ACI for ADSP. So, you know, I, I, told, uh, I told my boss, this is something we need at FAA too. We need a team like this to come in and test our systems and, uh, and bring a completely different perspective than what the agency is used to. Um, so, so that coming together of the researchers, of the research community, um, of the safety uh, folks, uh, you know, of the air traffic controllers and uh, the IT people, all that has to happen because it's, it's really about bringing all those disciplines together uh, to tackle, which is what is a very difficult sort of problem. I mean, we are looking at risks uh, across the ecosystem. And so that conversation needs to happen between the different disciplines. I just did an online cyber course uh, through Harvard uh, a month or so ago. I finished it. Uh, it was like an eight-week class. Let me just share a couple of things. Every organization, uh, including aviation, has operational risks, reputational risks, and legal risks when it comes to cybersecurity. So a cyber breach can cause huge damage, uh, millions of dollars, uh, in terms of your operations, in terms of your reputation. Something to think about. Second is that uh, we need a culture within cybersecurity where we reward people for being uh, skeptical. You know, you don't want to just kind of reward people who are, um, who are sort of agreeing with what's going on. You want people to look skeptically at what's going on and, and tell you a different way to do things. We want to reward people who want to break things because that can lead to a more cyber secure posture. And a lot of the uh, challenge that we face today as organizations uh, has to do with information sharing, uh, has to do with uh, culture change and trust building. And so all of that, those are the tasks that we are all involved with. Um, so information sharing should be happening all the time. And that's what the ACI is uh, designed to do within the government between our three big departments and with industry. I want to, the last thing I want to say um, is also the fact that the aviation ecosystem faces um, a lot of state and non-state cyber threats. Uh, the threats are very real. 
Uh, there are known vulnerabilities within this ecosystem. We all recognize that. So um, uh, that can impact the operations within the national airspace and civil flights. Um, and the fact is we got to tackle those threats and risks together. And so uh, the FAA issues cyber situation reports today, which, uh, which are, you know, which address uh, specific equities across this ecosystem. And some of those are externally tailored to partners outside of FAA. So uh, those include, uh, you know, other federal agencies and industry uh, partners. And uh, that's, uh, that's what I have. So thanks, Katie. Yeah, awesome. It's really exciting to kind of hear some of the things that, that get passed around and just really are exciting initiatives. The Pentagon has, I know, been deeply involved in aviation for, you know, I was in the Air Force, so, you know, since forever. And so uh, it's really great to see these very, very established organizations get excited about working with research and breaking things. That just, that just makes my day. Um, so these are really awesome initiatives and I'm really excited about them. Um, I want to move to the future for a little while. We kind of talked about the past and we talked about the current and then I, I want to kind of talk about the future really quick. And so I think the DOD has got kind of a really fun uh, new initiative that I'd love to hear more about. And I think it's called the, the In Factor. So Al, can you talk to us about the In Factor? Hey, sure, Katie. Um, hey, just a, as a little background before we dive right into the end factor. So we've talked a lot about identifying and sharing cyber vulnerabilities, uh, sharing information. But going forward, the future is that we need to work together to close those vulnerabilities using a threat-informed risk-based approach. Um, and that points us to two trends uh, the aviation ecosystem must address. You know, like Sid said, um, the first trend is the cyber threat to aviation is real and growing. So it's, it's highly likely that advanced nefarious cyber actors to include adversary nation states will use cyberspace to steal our aviation intellectual property and to conduct uh, cyber operations to damage the reputation of US and allied aircraft and aviation industries to gain a competitive advantages for their own industries. And so from a national security perspective, improving the cybersecurity and resilience of our own nation's aviation ecosystem to counter this threat is key. And for the Department of Defense, we have to be able to project power, defend the homeland, and protecting critical aviation infrastructure is part of that. Um, but there's one thing we acknowledge. This challenge is not something the Department of Defense or the government can do on its own. So recognizing these two trends, uh, or recognizing that trend, you know, requires an increase in a public and private sector collaboration or whole of nation approach. Um, I don't know if, if you're aware, but Congress recently cha uh, chartered the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. And in this commission report, it identified uh, the need to increase public and private sector collaboration. And uh, the goal is to improve our speed and agility in addressing cybersecurity and resilience uh, threats. And so the N factor that you referred to, which stands for the National Federation of Aviation Cyber Test Organizations and Researchers, the N factor, is a great example of how the Aviation Cyber Initiative is pushing to work on this. And so the thing that the Aviation Cyber Initiative does is, you know, we bring together that whole nation approach, bring together the cyber experts from federal uh, agencies, state agencies, uh, industry, uh, our federally funded research and development centers, our university affiliated research centers, um, our uh, national labs, all working together in the end factor to achieve three lines of effort. And those lines of effort are one is uh, to catalog, collaborate, and connect. <clears throat> and so, you know, just at a top level, we talk about catalog. Our big push is to create a national level aviation cyber resource guide. And the, the goal of this resource guide is to be an online accessible and searchable database of aviation cyber research, development, test and evaluation resources, uh, expertise, uh, facilities and capabilities. And so if you're part of the N Factor and you're working on an initiative to, uh, uh, to counter, uh, uh, to look at cyber fuzzing or any of these other kind of cyber um, trends, um, you could go to the uh, resource guide and it'll give you a list of who's working in that space, what kind of capabilities they have to test, and what, and more importantly, how you can get to hold, get a hold of them 
to further collaborate. And so the collaboration is our second line of effort. You know, the goal of the collaboration uh, uh, is to create a persistent collaboration forum where these cyber experts, this whole nation approach can get together and be able to uh, uh, spotlight or showcase capabilities, uh, share information on uh, projects. And more importantly, if a, like, let's say for example, you're working a, a project on intrusion detection, cyber anomaly and intrusion detection. You can come to the end factor and present your project and, and give us ask. And in the ask, uh, the goal for the ask is that the end uh, factor try to close those gaps. And when we talk about closing those gaps, we call that a connect. And that's the third line of effort, to connect projects, efforts, research um, papers with resources to do things like test, validate, and to move forward um, projects. And just, just a couple examples, <laughs> you know, on the collaboration side, uh, Johns Hopkins APL did a presentation on how they were doing cyber modeling on various aircraft. Um, and uh, the aircraft they were uh, um, doing the modeling on, it so happened, you know, since John Craig was on, uh, well, they were Boeing aircraft. And so, you know, after the meeting, uh, John and his team got together and said, hey, we probably need to know more about this modeling effort. And oh, by the way, maybe we can work with Johns Hopkins to make it better. And so right now, that's what we call a connect. We're working to bring those uh, Johns Hopkins, APL, and Boeing together to talk about how they can enhance that cyber modeling. And then on the resource sharing side, we had a project come forward that was working on a cyber anomaly and intrusion detection capability. It was AI machine learning based. And they needed a, a, a data tap to pull data from a 1553 bus. Uh, they didn't have it. And they also needed large quantities of data to support you know, training a machine learning and AI capable tool. And so we connected them with the Air Force Research Lab and provided a tool called Vampire, which is a uh, aviation bus tap and shipped that to them. And then Johns Hopkins APL again came through and they've been working on a data sharing effort that's been fantastic um, uh, in terms of connecting. So those are the kind of things that the N factor is trying to do. And we're trying to do it at scale. And, and so, that get, leads us to the, uh, I'm sure people are saying, so how do you participate in the N factor? <laughs> well, we got a couple, couple asks. You know, first off, we're focused right now on US organizations. Um, so if you wanna be a part of the N factor, what we ask you to do is three things. First, we want you to one, um, agree to populate our aviation cyber resource guide with your company's capabilities and resources. Um, so that's one. Uh, the second one is, uh, we want um, you to participate in our tight 90-minute monthly forum. Uh, it's, it's the InFactor Collaboration Forum. Um, and our, our goal is to be able to showcase all our major participants as we go forward um, and uh, to participate in follow-on meetings, you know, should those connects happen. And the third one is that is the connect part, that if you have capacity and if you have resources, we would like for you to help connect others um, to serve as a mechanism to accelerate our cyber innovation and the aviation ecosystem. And so that's the kind of the three asks. Um, I tell you, uh, just yesterday, we had uh, nearly 100 participants from across more than 60 organizations uh, participate in the InFactor Forum. Um, our FAA Tech Center um, and uh, DOD guides are, are working to deliver the Aviation Cyber Resource Guide by um, the end of August, at least the first instantiation of it. It's based on the FAA's technical capabilities library. Uh, and uh, I would say, you know, in fact, is growing. Um, and I think it's exceeding many of our expectations. And what we want to do is get more people to work with us so we can do what I like to say, collaborate with effect. And so that's, that's the in factor going forward, working to address the threat and to increase our public and private sector cooperation across the aviation ecosystem. So Al, let me ask you really quickly, is that is this initiative specific to military aviation or is it open to civil aviation as well? No, it's it's uh, it's it's not limited to uh, military aviation at all. In fact, it's not a DOD initiative. It's an aviation cyber initiative initiative. And so, you know, we have a, a charter to engage industry. And so we're we're working to do that in spades. And, uh, um, you know, at least a couple times a week, we're reaching out. Um, to bring our industry partners and really small businesses, 
you know, which we think the small business uh, businesses are real um, powerhouses in innovation. And, uh, you know, when we can connect them with the larger big companies like the Raytheons and Boeings of the world, then we can, we believe that we'll be able to accelerate um, aviation cybersecurity capabilities. Awesome, awesome. Um, so we have about eight minutes or so left. And so I really want to uh, close up with some of our closing thoughts and um, some just kind of words of wisdom and things that we've learned uh, from each one of the participants. Um, so Randy, can we start with you? Some, what are your, what are your words of wisdom, things to take away, uh, closing thoughts? Things to take away. Well, I'll tell you what, Katie, I'm, I'm super proud of what we're doing under ACI. I think it's, I think, I think it's time that we we reach out across the entire ecosystem and try to pull people together and have those conversations, address those, those vulnerabilities. And, and I think, Frankly, I think this is beginning to work. Uh, you know, working for DHS CISA, you know, I've got that, that outward look. I'm looking to industry. Uh, I can pick up the phone and call virtually anybody on this panel at any time. And if they're not in a meeting, which they always are, they'll answer the phone and we'll have a conversation. This is, this is collaboration at its finest. And, and I got to say, you know, and I know we're limited on time, so I'll, I'll stop it here. I love my job, and that, and these are the reasons why I love my job. The people on the panel, the things that we're trying to accomplish, and what we're trying to do through ACI. I'm very proud of that. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, I'm, it's something that I think is really going to make a difference, and that's that's very exciting. I'm excited to be proud of it or to be part of it. Um, Sid, what are your what are your thoughts? Well, I. Uh... I want to say that uh, COVID-19 obviously has affected the aviation industry. It's transforming. It's going to transform how we travel. It's going to change so many things. And uh, uh, we're, you know, we're going through a change right now as an aviation industry. But that does not mean we ignore the cyber threats. Um, the work we are doing here uh, uh, on this panel and, and uh, the work I do through the ACI uh, is incredibly important. Uh, the cyber threats are real from both state and non-state actors. Um, it's a combination of physical security and cyber security and the information technology and operational technology, uh, safety, security, all of that. And uh, the ecosystem is a vast, complex network. So uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, vulnerabilities to it. Uh, a cyber breach can happen anytime. Uh, there are threats out there, and uh, an attack can cause millions of do dollars of damage uh, and a loss of reputation. So uh, it can shake uh, public confidence. It can change, again, the nature of flying. Uh, so we cannot ignore it. Uh, I think the work we are doing is super important, and I am I'm privileged and I feel lucky to be part of this team of so many smart people who are doing such incredible work. So uh, thank you for having me. You have my contact information, so I, I urge you all to reach out to me anytime. Awesome. John? So, um, you know, the last year has been interesting, and we have got much more of a focus at Boeing on this. Um, we do daily report outs to the board of directors. In fact, we have a champion on our board. We are leveraging our enterprise to not only help us with incident response, but um, you know, helping to uh, beef up our um, design guides. We have expanded our product uh, uh, cert team, um, and we're being much more proactive at looking at things. Um, you know, and then we're looking at things across board. How do you create a um, process to evaluate threats and risks and we're looking into that we're actually working with uh, you know industry and the government um, on you know how do we do that effectively but key is we're really starting to engage outside of aerospace and I think that's going to be the um, thing that really helps us the most you know the tech council is one but participation at DEFCOM so we can build those relationships 
RSA conferences, et cetera. So it's pretty exciting. It, it's really exciting right now and a little uncomfortable, but it's good. So thanks. Yeah, embrace the uncomfort. <laughs> Jen? Yeah. Um, Katie, I'm honestly kind of blown away. Um, you know, I think, I think the whole purpose of the Aerospace Village is to um, increase understanding and appreciation of the importance of cybersecurity in aviation and to do so in a way that builds trust um, between the security community, the aviation industry, um, and the government, which all play a very, very important role in advancing cybersecurity in aviation. And when I sit and I listen to my fellow panelists talking about some of the amazing initiatives they've got going on and hear their attitudes and their responses to the research and that kind of stuff, I just, I feel like we're in such a dramatically different position to where we were a couple of years ago. And I hear people saying that they want to hear from the research community. They want to hear from the security community. They want to partner and collaborate. And that is, that's an incredible opportunity. And I hope that anybody listening, um, particularly people who are participating in security research in some way, that they get a lot of hope and optimism from this and feel that they can engage and that they can build trust. They can build empathy and they can get involved. Yeah, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm the, the trust and the relationships, I think, are some of the most important factors in all of this. It's, it's, it's getting involved. Um, so, yeah, getting involved. Jeff, information sharing, what have you got? What are your thoughts? Oh, thanks a lot. I think this has been a great discussion. And, you know, we only went through one example. Uh, but at the Aviation ISAC, we've had several uh, of these uh, events happen over the last couple of years, and each one of them pretty much follows this pattern of uh, building a great relationship with a security researcher, finding out, you know, what a, a, a vulnerability is that they've discovered, and then going through that validation process of, you know, is it really an issue or isn't it an issue, and then, you know, working through uh, the remediations and disclosures when those have to happen. And, uh, you know, likewise, we have found this to be uh, incredibly eye-opening um, and, and, I mean, so much so with the researchers, we've even hired one, which uh, uh, helps us tremendously, particularly in the, the work that we're doing now. So um, I, I am glad that uh, uh, there's been kind of this breakthrough and that we're seeing, um, you know, the, the bridge is being built and uh, only think it's, uh, it's going to get better. Awesome. Al, what are your what are your closing remarks, closing thoughts? Okay, hey Katie. Um, so kind of echoing across the board, uh, I think the most important thing is what, one is we have to recognize that the threat is real, and, and we should learn from the maritime sector's uh, no petcha attack. Uh, we shouldn't have to wait until a serious cyber attack of our own on the aviation ecosystem occurs. And the key to to uh, preventing that is to embrace the idea that there's safety in the herd. You know, we need to strengthen the aviation herd, you know, by continuing to share information, vulnerabilities, and work together to address those vulnerabilities to improve our aviation cybersecurity and resilience. And so threats real and there's safety in the herd. Terribly true, very true. So I guess my closing remarks then, um, I will say that the thing that I take away from all of these things is that I go back to coordinated vulnerability disclosure and I say that coordinated vulnerability disclosure is an essential part of any security research. I think that everyone here and everyone that I've met from varying backgrounds all over the world, everyone has the same goal. We may not all speak the same language, we may, all, we may talk past each other, but I think ultimately this, we have the same goal and that goal is protecting the end user. It's reducing risk and making people safer. And so I think the last thing that anybody wants is to inadvertently put countless people's lives at risk, economic situation at risk, um, because we published a roadmap that if that fell into the wrong hands could just wreak havoc. Um, so I, I go for coordinated vulnerability disclosure because it really is a balancing act. It's a, it's a process that allows us to mitigate uh, while we're, or to, to balance while we're trying to mitigate. So that's my, that's my closing advice. I, I, uh, I feel like all of the, the all of the progress that we've made is so wonderful. We have we have a long way to go. I think that uh, I I love the fact that we're all talking to each other and we're working together. But I want to make sure we know that there is a road ahead of us, and that road to me, it the future looks bright, and I'm I'm excited for it. So 
thank you guys for coming to the panel and listening to us. And if you have any questions, um, our contact information is up. Um, I think there's going to be an opportunity for some live chat later at some point. So uh, you'll be able to find out more information about that. Uh, if you have any questions or want to talk more to us, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I think everyone here would, would invite a conversation. So it was great talking to everybody today. Thank you.